All right, it is uh, two o'clock, so let's get started. Um, just as a reminder, uh, right off the bat, um, homework will be due Sunday, like always, every week. So I'll post the third part of our assignments um, on Blackboard under Tools, Wiley, Wiley Assignments. Monday is a holiday, so we won't be having a lecture that day. Um, but let me open up the PowerPoint. We have just a little bit to cover from Wednesday. Then we'll get right into uh, what we're talking about today. Okay. One sec. There we go. I think somebody was accidentally unmuted there for a second. And let me close my mail. All right. So we left off on Wednesday talking about how we actually sequence on the genome, the different methods. So we were talking about the chain terminator sequencing method. Um, then pyro sequencing and luminance sequencing, and then how we put the pieces back together. And by sequencing so many human genomes, we're able to look at the uh, DNA in the genome and, and just get some big picture ideas about what's going on. And so that's what's being shown in these charts. It's basically, you know, what is our genome um, made of? And before starting this, before starting the Human Genome Project, most people, I would assume, would think that our genome is mostly encoding proteins, right? Because um, proteins you know, make up what's inside the cells. They're the workhorses of the cells. They are doing important functions inside the cells. But only 1.5% of our entire genome is making protons. Um, it's amazing, 25.9% of our genome is just strictly introns, right? Um, and we have some transposons. Transposons are things that are making um, DNA move around in our genome. Um, we just had <laughs> duplications, just repetitive sequences, uh, simple repetitive sequences, um, miscellaneous, just unique sequences, these lines and signs um, but that we might touch on a little bit later in the semester. But yeah, it's, it's really surprising when you look at it. Most of the DNA in our body does not encode for protein. And if we look at what are encoding for proteins, 37.4% is unknown. We don't know what protein it's encoding for. We have no idea what it's really doing right now. And so even though we have genomes that are completely sequenced, you can see there's still a lot of work that has to be done to really understand what is going on in our genome. And that's kind of a big point in biochemistry in general or cell molecular biology. Everything is way more complicated than we think it is in that you know we learn those bits in pieces, and you might hear about like, you know, scientists in such and such a country discovered this about the cell, like you should stop drinking coffee because as such and such happens, or you should stop eating carbohydrates. Um, everything is so vastly complex inside the cell that we are just scratching the surface, and anything that we really discover is so intertwined, it's hard to make these big picture assumptions exactly what's going on. And so there is so much more to learn about the um, genome, the human genome. Now, speaking about um, uh, genomes, we have um, looked at other organisms as well. We found some very interesting uh, uh, similarities, one between humans and chimpanzees, right? The amount of DNA that's different between human in chimpanzees, it's roughly like 1.2%, which is kind of amazing when you just look at a human versus a chimpanzee, you would think there's a lot more different. I mean, we look totally different, but really there's not that much different on the genome level. Also, these two types of corn, I'm not sure if you saw this image in your book, but um, 
this is more or less like wild corn, original wild corn. And all that's different than the corn we eat now. It's just a few proteins, a few se sequences of genome that causes such massive differences. So just little changes in the genome can cause uh, very big differences. Now I have this question over here. Um, I, I will just kind of go through what I'm talking about there so we can get on to uh, today's work. But when we look at uh, prokaryotes versus eukaryotes, we notice that you know uh, prokaryotes, their genome is much more condensed. They have a much bigger gene density. And a gene density is strictly you know, the number of genes um, per like megabase pair. So if you look at prokaryotes versus eukaryotes, eukaryotes have all this other stuff that aren't genes. While you know, prokaryotes really don't, like they don't have introns, for example. So their genome is much more uh, condensed. So that's just kind of what this question was getting at. We're not gonna go through the math. Um, I'm not gonna ask you that math question like on an exam. Um, just, just the overall idea that you know, a prokaryotic genome is, has a much higher gene density than a eukaryote. Um, so are there any questions about like what this slide is saying, what the general idea is? or we'll move on to manipulating uh, DNA next. Okay, um, so let me open today's slide. Those of you who took molecular cell and biology, um, this, this upcoming stuff might be a little familiar to you. Um, because honestly, biochemistry and MCB aren't all that different. Let me pop this up. All right. What we're going to talk about today is how we manipulate DNA inside of a lab. Um, we're going to talk about recombinant DNA technology, how to clone, how to do genetic engineering. Um, and this, is, this allows us to isolate, isolate a sequence, amplify it, and modify it um, based on our needs, right? And there's four general steps to uh, obtaining and amplifying a segment of DNA. One, you have to get the DNA, right? And you need to make many copies of it. So you can get some DNA by chopping it out using restriction enzymes and then amplifying it using PCR. Or you can just make DNA de novo. That is, you can just link a new DNA without having to have an organism. Chemical synthesis is way more expensive usually than just getting a sequence from an organism and harvesting it from the uh, genome itself, but you can do that. Once you have a fragment of DNA that you want to amplify, you need to incorporate it into another DNA molecule which we call a vector. And a vector will have sequences that will replicate the DNA and also some way to produce your gene of interest. Once we have the vector ready to go, we need to introduce it into the cells and then inside the cells, this vector will replicate. And then once we have cells with our vector, we have to have some way of knowing these cells have our vector. So we have to identify or screen these cells. So um, today, and I believe Monday as well, we're gonna really go through uh, these four steps in detail so we can better learn how to manipulate DNA. So let's just first start with um, our plasmid, our vector. So a plasmid is just a, uh, here is circular DNA and it's a way that we can insert any sequence we want basically into this plasmid, take this plasmid that has our DNA inserted into it and, and put that into a bacteria, have it grow and uh, have it grow our protein. So what factors make a plasmid viable for cloning? So I, I will answer this one. Um, so what do we need? Well, we need one, a selectable marker. And that's actually shown right here. Selectable marker. 
So what do I mean by a selectable marker? This is a way we can determine if our bacteria or our yeast or whatever organism we're using, if it has our vector of interest. So this is how um, the marker works in this uh, plasma. Plasma UC18, PUC18, uh, standing for Plasma University of California 18th variant. All right, so you can see we have this AMP R. This is ampicillin resistance. Let me just see. In my test one area, I had a different lesson under 9.4. Ooh, do I? Let me just double check that. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Let me double check that. Oh, I have general chemistry in there. My bad. Yeah, we are not going to be learning about the mass of an isotope. Um, so give me one sec. I will pop that up right on the blackboard for so for those of you um, who want to follow along. Again, I apologize for that. Probably won't be the last time that happens. So, um, so this is totally my fault. But any of if you ever like open up one of these in advance and you see, oh, we're gonna learn about atoms today. How cool! That's probably wrong. It's probably my fault. So um, again, my totally my mistake. But if you see that, just just shoot me an email. I can definitely fix that. All right, updated. Should have the correct one now. Yeah. It. If you ever think we're going to do something from Gen Chem, we're never going to do that. It's definitely a mistake. Yeah. So. Anyways, back to where I was. So we're talking about um, selectable marker. Um, this is just a way, like I said, to make sure our E. coli, our yeast, have our vector of interest. Here we're using ampicillin, right? So the idea is we take a bunch of bacteria and we try to give these bacteria our plasmid. And we're gonna go over all the steps to do this later. But once, once we give bacteria our plasmid, we put them on a plate with the antibiotic ampicillin. And the idea is if the bacteria has our plasmid, it is resistant to ampicillin. If bacteria don't have our plasmid, they die. And so this is a way we can select bacteria that only has our plasmid because they have ampicillin resistance. Um, another way you can do it is through color. So there's a method called blue-white screening, where if you have your plasmid and you add a, a small molecule, the bacteria that have your plasmid will actually change color. So that's another way to do it. So that's, that's one thing. Um, two, you need um, what are called uh, a restriction site, right? Or um, um, multiple cloning site, MCS multiple cloning site, cloning. cannot spell. So what an MCS is, is just an area in your plasmid that has a lot of restriction enzyme sites. So you can see right here in PUC18, we have a ton of restriction enzyme sites located in one small area of the plasmid which is next to the lac operon. And so the idea is that you have multiple restriction enzyme sites. You put your DNA of interest using one of these, or rather two of these restriction enzymes. It's right next to this lac operon. You add lactose, and then it'll make your protein. So we need some way to, one, turn on our protein, on two, another way to insert it. So our uh, multiple cloning site will do that. Your plasmid also needs to be able to self-replicate. 
That is, we want it when it goes inside the cell, we want it to replicate independent of the host organism genome. And we want to replicate, have it replicate so there's like 100 to 1,000 copies inside the host. Um, the more copies of this plasmid there are, the more protein you'll make, right? So any questions? Oh, and size. Uh, we don't want a plasma that's like too big. Um, so like anything less than 10,000 bases, 10 kilobases is good. Um, if it's too big, then it won't, we can't shove it into bacteria. And that's kind of what you do. You kind of just shove it in there. Um, any questions about what factors make a plasmid viable for cloning? Mm -hmm. uh, the LAC-C is not quite the MCS. The, the MCS is found in the LAC-C, right? So all these little, all these um, cloning sites or all these restriction enzyme sites, that's the MCS. It's just located in the LAC operon, which is what the LAC-C is saying. It's saying this is where the LAC operon is. And if you're looking at a real picture of uh, PUC18, it would be a lot more detailed and it would say like um, repressor site right here, right? Like initiation, like right there, uh, gene right here. Um, but basically you're just downstream of where um, um, translation or rather transcription will happen once you add your molecule of interest. And we're just using the LAC operon system. So that's what the LAC I and the LAC C system means. It's just saying LAC operon here, more or less. So what restriction enzymes would you use? Basically anything in the MCS. Um, what you definitely don't want to use, <laughs> you don't want to put your protein of interest over here in the ampicillin resistance because then you're gonna ruin ampicillin resistance and all bacteria will die. Um, you don't wanna put it where uh, Higgy or AF3 is because you want to have it be turned on when you add like lactose. So you want it in the lac operon. That's why these MCS, they're created by people. That's why it's called Plasma University of California people at the University of California created this. They genetically modified this vector to have an MCS, to have this system of ampicillin resistance in the lac operon. And they, they specifically made the MCS in the perfect position. So when you are looking at a plasmid and you're thinking, should I use this or where should I insert my DNA? It's usually pretty obvious. You're gonna see one area that's just, you know, 40, restriction enzyme sites are right in one place. So um, you can use any uh, restriction enzyme in the MCS. And just an open question, I'm just wondering how, what people think about this. Um, do you think it's ethical to create slash use GMOs? And if you wanna send a chat privately, I can also read out your opinion without giving a name out. But I'm, I'm generally curious where this is at, um, you know, in your head, because I know when I go shopping and I, I search for like produce, um, there's this big distinction of like non-GMO, non-GMO, non-GMO. Have some friends on Facebook who are also, you know, GMOs are evil and all that. Um, and so, one, there's that idea of, is it ethical, okay for like plants? But I don't know if you heard this story yet, but oh, about a year and a half ago now, it's been a while, um, this Chinese scientist, he kind of produced the first genetically modified humans um, without telling anybody until he did it and until like they were born. And he's like, surprise, I did it. Um, Basically, he used what's called CRISPR-Cas9, which is a big buzzword now, to modify the genome of two baby twins um, before they were born. And the idea was, what, what he says was, that he was trying to knock out their ability to get AIDS. So he was trying to make them um, uh, 
immune to HIV by knocking out some some like specific um, protein which, which HIV uses to get inside the cell. Um, so you look at the two baby girls and it looks like it worked okay. Um, they weren't complete knockouts. Um, another thing is that this gene that also controls um, uh, this ability to knock out also controls memory. So if some people were thinking, were you just trying to like genetically modify like smarter humans and just had this cover story? Um, and so he went to jail, I think for four months, it was fined like $400,000. But from his work, there are now other scientists who are saying, you know, he did it. The Pandora's box is already open. We're going to continue with this. So anyone have like thoughts or ideas about this? Um, so yeah, there, uh, one of the potential side effects is that um, people who have this knocked out naturally, yeah, they have a 20% higher chance of dying before the age of 75, if I read that right. So um, it'll be interesting. It's, it's unfortunate that, you know, two human beings are an experiment without their knowledge. They had no way they could ever say yes or no to it. Um, but we'll have to watch how, how that unfolds. But yeah, does anyone have like any thoughts of GMOs? I think it's the start of a dystopian empire where genetically modified humans will be marked. So you're thinking that um, GMO humans it's, it's just inevitable that people are just gonna, everyone's gonna GMO their baby or something like that. Is that what you're saying? Like, it's happening, there's no way to stop it. I'm guessing since you said dystopian, you don't think it's ethical to do that. Pretty sure the receptor is needed for other things, so it could have a bad effect in the future. Um, yeah, so that, that, that receptor, at least from my reading, does help control memory. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's super complex. So it's, so it's hard to really, the body is extremely complex. That's why I, I kind of laugh when I see these people called like biohackers who like have like a little bit knowledge of biochemistry and like, well, I read this one sentence, so I know how the body works, so I'm gonna take this supplement. Um, isn't it just a form of eugenics? Yeah, kind of, um, where you, you are trying, trying to get desirable traits or correct something. I mean, let's look on the flip side, right? So um, cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is basically you don't have a specific protein, um, so you get cystic fibrosis. Would you be against using, like, so if, if you know, for example, you have an embryo, uh, you can 100% say without any side effects, I can fix cystic fibrosis by changing this person's DNA. Would it be okay to do that or just say, nope, cannot change DNA, cannot change what's going to happen? Uh, there will be regular humans and modified humans, and it will be unfair that the unfairness will cause an unbalance of society, and we will fall to chaos. Only the rich will have access to beneficial modification of current genetic diseases and such. Yeah, this will probably be um, um, available to the wealthy at first, as all medical things are. Um, I will say you can always already kind of do eugenics if you wanted to. Um, I'm not saying it's done, but we have enough technology to know like, you know, sex of a baby for sure, uh, hair color, um, more kind of, um, just from looking at DNA, we can al already look at some traits. I don't think it would ever become mainstream anyways, because medical field will lose millions of dollars. Um, I don't know about that, because you could make the argument they would make a ton of money if they open that up um, to, to fixing things. Plus, I, I like to, I personally, I personally like to think that humans are generally good. And I think there's enough good doctors out there and researchers who would push forward rather than always be capitalistic. That's just maybe my na naivety. Super babies, maybe. Um, brave new world. How about, okay, how about for food? 
does anyone have any ideas of GMOs for food or not? Let's, let's, let's take it down from humans and just go food. Is it ethical to create GMO food? GMO crops? Anyone wanna have any ideas on that? FDA is gonna be bought out by big pharmaceutical and they will allow GMO foods. So I'm guessing you're against GMO foods. It's kind of hard to read from text. Oh, you love GMO foods, okay. Well, the FDA kind of already allows GMO foods, right? GMO foods are a thing. You, can, you buy them in the supermarket all the time. Let's get some vegetables that taste like steak. Uh, well, we already can make burgers out of vegetables. And so I'm waiting for, like, I love those veggie burgers, like, that they just made. So if they can make veggie steaks, that's fine. Purple bananas. Um, I do not know about purple bananas. I've never heard of that. I think people just keep wanting and wanting. And so the only one to keep up to use GMOs, but then they don't like to hear that they use a shortcut, but they also don't want to pay extra for it. So the funny thing is GMOs are usually cheaper than non-GMOs, at least when I go to the supermarket. Um, but yeah, so population's exploding. Um, conditions are getting worse for growing stuff. So in the future, maybe we have to use some kind of genetically modified wheat to survive harsh conditions. So it, it's probably inevitable, I think, but you know, I don't have a problem with it personally. Um, give me all the GMO stuff that you want. Um, there is some shady practices with it when it comes to farmers. Like if, if you sell farmers GMO corn, you, they're not like, I think this is right. They're not allowed to like harvest the seeds and reuse them. They have to go back to the place and buy more seeds. So um, there's, there's, there's some weird stuff. Pretty patties from SpongeBob. I've not watched SpongeBob, so this is gonna go over my head. Will become reality and that's how they will convince the next generation to accept GMOs. And with the acceptance, they'll start using more expensive weird looking GMOs. So I don't think it'll be weird. I think it's gonna be useful, drought resistant, insect resistant, virus resistant. I don't think they're gonna make like glow in the dark stuff. They can already make glow in the dark food if they wanted to. Um, anyways, that's just our fun little discussion about GMOs. Um, because often I get, I, I get lured into Facebook conversations about them and they're not, too, I don't know why I let myself do that. Yeah, let's get back to the topic at hand. Let's talk about how we actually grow GMOs. GMO is just a genetically modified organism. So anytime you modify the DNA of anything, you create a GMO. All right, so let's say you have your DNA of interest, right? And you wanna put it into your vector of interest. The first thing you need to do is use those restriction endonucleases that we talked about and make cuts. Now you need to use the same restriction endonucleases on the vector and the DNA. And generally you use two uh, different ones. You know, uh, maybe like use one endonuclease here. So I'm gonna call that E1 and make one right here, E2, to make two different cuts. Um, yeah, you definitely wanna use two there. Then once you have your cut vector and your cut DNA, you kind of just stick them together and try to join them together to make what's called a chimera, uh, chimeric DNA. Now, often we will use E. coli to grow uh, eukaryotic proteins. That is not out of the question. Um, what are some problems anyone can think about growing eukaryotic proteins in E. coli? What could be an issue with that? Let's see how much MCB we know. They won't have all the resources they need. I uh, need a little more specific. Introns, yes, that is one problem. Uh, prokaryotes don't have introns. 
uh, eukaryote stew. So if you want to grow your eukaryotic protein in E. coli, you have to get rid of the introns. You can only have exons. Yep, so no introns. Post-translational modifications, yes. Uh, PTSM, post-translational modifications. Uh, prokaryotes do not post-translate uh, modify their proteins after they've already been created, really. Eukaryotes do it all the time. Um, we do a lot of post-translational modifications, adding lipids, adding different functional groups. Um, so modifications. Um, also, uh, sugar tags. Yeah, so that has to do with post-translational modifications. Uh, prokaryotes don't put sugars on their proteins. Like, we do like 70% of the time or something like that. Um, what also can be a problem is that if you grow too much foreign protein inside of a prokaryote, um, you're gonna get what's called an inclusion body. Uh, I think it's inclusion body. Where basically they take all your protein and just shove it into like this vesicle for export. Um, so sometimes a prokaryote can know like, oh, this is a foreign protein. I'm, I'm, there's a lot of this in me. I'm gonna die, so let's get this protein together and get it out. So that can sometimes be a problem with growing uh, proteins in eukaryotes or prokaryotes too. Um, so that's A. B, so we are using something that creates sticky ends. Um, on Wednesday, I said that we have two types of endonucleases. One causes sticky ends, one causes blunt ends. What could be a problem for using blunt ends? Can anyone remember what I said on Wednesday about why you want sticky ends over blunt ends? Yeah, so, yep, so blunt ends, they can go in backwards, right? So here, blue's on the bottom, green's on the top, if it's a blunt end, there's no reason why it can't flip. You'll have green on the bottom, blue at the top, and you're gonna create the wrong protein. Uh, attachment won't occur where you want to. So attachment should still occur where you want to in that if this was blunt, let's just erase that and erase that, uh, erase that, erase that. You, you only have one opening. So you're kind of only forced to go there. What I will say though, is that attachment or the insertion is gonna be much, much lower because you don't have any hydrogen bonds um, sticking the DNA together like you do with an overhang. So it's gonna go into your plasmid at a much, much, much lower frequency than sticky ends. So you always really wanna use sticky ends. And what is the name of class of enzymes that connects DNA strands? It's actually right here. Those are called ligases. Yep, ligase. Anytime, um, yeah, anytime you see the word ligase, that's what you're doing. You're connecting uh, DNA together. So that's our first, first really step. We got to isolate DNA. Um, well, after we pick our plasmid, isolate DNA, um, get our sequence through DNA. Uh, through endonucleases, usually use PCR to amplify it. Then we stick it into a ligase, or sorry, into uh, not, not a ligase, a plasmid or a vector, and then ligase it together. Any questions about this part of the puzzle? And here's, well, if you have any, here's that picture I was talking about where um, the bacteria with your plasmid are colored differently. If you add like galactose, it's called a blue white screen. So you can just pick the colored colonies to know, oh, this has my um, plasma of interest. So just a different way to do it other than bacterial uh, antibiotic resistance. All right. So where do we get our gene of interest? Um, there are a lot of different ways to do it. What I'm gonna talk about is called a DNA library. Um, and what a DNA library is, is just a set of all the sequences of a particular organism. And this isn't like just some online database. It's a bunch of freezers that contain like every single imaginable 
a sequence of DNA for a different organism. And there's tons of different organisms out there. So let's say you're really interested in studying, I don't know, uh, rats, right? You, and you wanna start studying a new protein of rat in your lab and nobody studied that before, and you need the DNA sequence, you can just go online to this, uh, a company who has these genomic libraries, ask them to ship you this DNA sequence, and they will ship you that DNA sequence uh, ready to go. So there's, there's genomic libraries for bacteria, yeast, mouse, human, flies, any model organism will have this genomic library where all the genome has been more or less shotgun. So you take the genome and just hit it with a giant shotgun to chop it up and you store it and you're ready to go. And other than genomic library, there's something else called a cDNA library. Now for a cDNA library, what you do is that you isolate mRNA. And then from that mRNA, I know it's probably cut off right here, so I apologize for that. For that mRNA, you use it, what's called a reverse transcriptase. And this reverse transcriptase will create DNA from your RNA. So for any protein that would have been made inside that cell, you can get the DNA sample for it by using reverse transcriptase, and then you just store those in a freezer waiting for somebody to buy them. Um, so just to make sure that we understand what a genomic library is versus a cDNA library, I just have some uh, simple questions here. One, if I look at a genomic library versus a cDNA library, would they be the same size? Or would they be different? And feel free to just answer either same size or different in chat if you'd like. I mean, you can say it out loud. I just won't hear you. Genomic library versus cDNA library, size, anyone, anyone, same size, different size, one bigger, one less. So we have a vote for the same size. We have a vote for genomic. We have a vote for different. We have a vote for different. We have a vote for different. Um, cDNA would be smaller. cDNA is just RNA. Yeah, so cDNA would be a lot smaller because remember, cDNA is you taking the mRNA from uh, a cell, right? And just creating the DNA from that. If you remember at the very first slide we talked about, most, if you're looking at eukaryotic organism, most organisms, um, eukaryotic organisms, 1.5% of their genome is proteins. So in a cDNA library, you do not have 98.5% of the genome. Also, yes, you're cutting off introns, right? Because you, the mRNA has the introns removed as shown here. So the cDNA library is gonna be much smaller than genomic library, which is, has everything. Um, it has all the sequences in, in the organism, not protein, everything. You, like I said, you take a shotgun approach. You just chop up DNA and you just store them. And so cell types, would you expect uh, cDNA libraries from different cell types to be the same or different? So let's say I'm starting human and I have my choice between uh, a bone cell uh, and a skin cell. Do you think the cDNA libraries of a bone cell and a skin cell are the same? Just simply yes or no for that. They would be different. I think similar, but not the same. Different. Uh, yeah, because if you look at the proteins made, I would hope that the proteins made in my skin are different than what are made in my bones, because it would be pretty bad news if my bone was the same as my skin or my skin was the same as my bone. They need to do different things. How do you do different things? You specialize. How do you specialize? You create different proteins. You create different amounts of protein right? Um, different sequences of your DNA are turned on and off. So uh, 
cDNA libraries can be quite different depending on not only what organism, but what cell type. We only have so many different sequences is about the expression that makes them different between skin and bone. Uh, yeah, that's true. Um, you're going to express different um, um, proteins in those, right? So uh, skin, you're going to produce some proteins that you don't in bone and vice versa. Um, so there will be uh, stuff similar like um, um, like transports, like different transport proteins, different membrane proteins are going to be found in the same types, uh, both bone and skin. You know, both are going to have aquaporins, but there will be a lot of, a lot of differences um, in them, uh, I would say, about what proteins are actually being made in these two different cell types. All right. Next thing we're going to talk about is PCR, everybody's favorite experiment, polymerase chain reaction. What PCR does, it's a way to amplify DNA. And so let's say that we got our DNA of interest and we stuck that into the plasmid. After that, generally when we want to amplify this plasmid a lot, or you know, even before that, we want to amplify our gene of interest. And also in the lab, the great thing about buying a plasmid is that you only buy it once. Because if you're ever running low on, on a plasmid, you just do PCR and make more copies of it. And now you have an infinite amount of plasmid at your disposal. So that's a one-time purchase. So we're gonna look at the ways that we uh, run PCR. So there's generally only four steps. Um, step one, you add primers. These primers are made by you, so you make them on a computer, you send them to a company, and a company will send you oligomers, or just short DNA strands. And what these do is that they flank your, your area of interest. So they're, they're gonna be the bookends of saying where I want my DNA to be replicated. Then you separate the DNAs. Once you add the primers, uh, the, the steps that are repeated are two and four two, three, and four. Uh, so you heat your uh, DNA to 95C. This will melt the DNA and separate the strands. Um, note, when you are that hot, you will not break DNA. Um, 95C is not strong enough to break a covalent bond. It's strong enough to break your hydrogen bonds, but you're not actually gonna break the DNA. So you separate the strands. Then you cool to 55 and you're allowing your primers now to anneal to your DNA. Then you raise the temperature to 72 and this will allow your polymerase to replicate the DNA. And you do this like 30 times. Now, there are some cool things you can do with PCR. You can not only duplicate, but you can incorporate mutations. So if you have mismatched nucleotides, but most of your nucleotides still hydrogen bond, your primer will still fit your, your area of interest, but you can incorporate these new mutations and change your protein, make a new protein. Uh, do we have to memorize the four steps and temperatures? Uh, you need to know how PCR works, so you need to know the steps, yeah. Uh, don't be surprised if I have the question, explain to me how PCR works, yes. So I think the best way to really look at this is going to be um, primers, separate, anneal, duplicate. Yeah, basically. Uh, let's take a look at a movie of this. And it's not so much a movie as more PowerPoint slides that weren't made by me, but I stole it. So all credit to the person who I stole this from at the University of Iowa. Um, with her permission, she let me do it. Okay, so we start with our DNA strand, our, and here is just five prime, three prime. Step one, heat to 95. This will separate your DNA. Step two, cool down to 55, allowing your primers to anneal. So here we have a blue primer and a red primer. Raise to 72, extend. And so your polymerase are coming in and now you're making new DNA. 
So after one round of PCR, you now have doubled the amount of DNA you have. So now you have two to the power one DNA. So star DNA, let me just skip down here. Star DNA is the sequence you actually want. It's the sequence that you want that are flanked by your primers. After one round of D, uh, PCR, you have not made any target DNA. You just duplicated like one segment of DNA. So you have two non-star DNAs. You have two strands of DNAs, but it's not the sequence that you want because you just want a specific sequence. How does TAC polymerase know when to stop when it runs out? Um, so TAC polymerase, um, so, and this would, this is something that's actually like covered in biochem two. I can just go through it really quick. If it's a plasmid, um, TAC polymerase runs in both directions. And sometimes in a real plasmid or a real genome, there are stop signals that like cause the um, polymerase to stop. And then when the other one comes and hits it, then they fall off. On a small plasmid like this, you still go both directions. And then you just hit each other and then, you're, then you fall off after you hit each other. On linear DNA, you go to the end and then you're done. Um, so that's kind of like how it stops. It either hits itself or hits its clone or it just runs out of DNA to make. All right. So that's after one round. Round two, do this again. Heat to separate, cool down, anneal, go, elongation. Round two, we have made four DNAs. We have quadrupled our DNA. However, none of these DNAs are actually the sequence that we want. So we have four non-star DNAs and zero star DNAs. Okay, round three. So another cycle. Each cycle takes about what is it, like two and a half minutes or something like that, I forget the exact time. Round three, heat up, 95. Kneel, cool down to 55. Elongate, 72. Hey, we did it. After three rounds, we have now have a total of eight DNA. Six of these DNA, we don't want really, but two of these DNA, are now our sequences that are flanked by our primers. Let me just go back really quick. So that's what the, um, so you can see where our primers are here. Oh, I'm right, there we go. Our blue and our red, that's, that's the sequence we want flanked. And in this one, in this DNA sequence, we are making our, our flanked sequence. So yay, we have made two DNAs that we want. It only took three rounds. This is where things start to get fun now. Round four, heat up, anneal, elongate. Okay, after round four, we are even. We have eight non-star DNAs and eight DNAs that have our, our sequence that have been um, duplicated correctly. And I could do this whole thing or I could just show you the results. So after 10 rounds, we made 1,024 DNAs. Only 20 of them are not the DNAs we want. 1,004 of them are the sequence that we want to duplicate it. And you generally run this roughly 30 times and you get millions of these star DNA. And like the amount of non-star DNA is just so small that you don't really even care. So see the math is two times N. All right, so two times n, if you do it 30 rounds, would be 60. And this is two to the power of n, so two raised to the power of 30 minus 60 is how many star DNAs you have. So that's why PCR is such a powerful technique in that as long as you have the primers, you can just mass amplify a specific sequence of DNA while not amplifying the other part of DNA that you don't want. or if it's a circle, like circular DNA, you just make you know, a million copies of this um, in the span of a couple hours. So um, revolutionary technique, uh, changed the face of biochemistry. The guy who did it, I think I talked about him in the video, was a total nut job, um, but he won the Nobel Prize for his genius idea. So he had one genius idea. So.
Um, yeah, that's, I think we're gonna call it there. I, I, I have some questions to go with that, but let's just pick that up on Wednesday, just so we have a refresher of what we talked about. Um, but any questions about um, PCR? And PCR is all, if you never done it in a lab, it's all automatic. All of these temperatures are done by a machine called a thermocycler. 30 years ago, well, actually 40 years ago now, um, before thermocyclers, you would have three uh, water baths and you would manually put them in each water bath. And before we discovered TAC polymerase, which is a um, thermal stable polymerase, what you would do is that after every round, you'd re-add polymerase. So literally, if you were like one of the lower people in the lab and you needed to do PCR, you would sit in front of like three water baths for like two and a half hours with a stopwatch and a pipette. Put in one thing, stopwatch go. Stop, next one, stopwatch go. Stop, next one, stopwatch go. Stop, pipette in, new one, stopwatch go. Do that 30 times, not fun, but. Now we can do that automatically. Is my email candrews at tammusa.edu? Uh, yes, it is. So, um, yeah, let me, let me email you so you can have it. Um, but yeah, that, that is my email. Yeah, um, if there's no other questions, um, I will put this up as always. Make sure that you uh, do your homework. Um, I will not see you on Monday because it's a holiday. Otherwise, have a good weekend, everybody.